Thanks, Anna. Um, so I'm a professional tourist. I have two rules. Uh, one is if you're going to work on a species, it has to live in an interesting place or it has to taste good. So I'm currently working on lobsters for good reason. Um, but I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, thanks to Kane for uh, the invite. Uh, I think it's a fantastic festival. I think it'll be even better next year when we're out of this mess uh, that we're in at the moment. Um, so, let me get this working. So, yesterday, uh, Mr. Rose presented a, a presentation. It was really interesting, and I would love to sit down and have a beer with him. He'd, he'd be a really interesting chap to talk to. Lots of great experiences. Um, and he, you know, there was some common sense in the stuff that he was saying. But I have some problems with some of the things that we're presented with, like we were presented with yesterday. We're, we're, we're constantly presented with some very simple ideas. And one of the ideas is that we should go back in time to the Pleistocene. You know, and the world would be a much better place if we lived in the Garden of Eden. And, uh, you know, we, all right, we wouldn't have iPhones and we wouldn't have NHS and we'd live short, brutish lives where we died at the age of 35. Um, and, and some of this comes from the, the fact that when the Europeans first discovered Africa, of course, Africa, Africa was always there and there were people living there, but when the Europeans first discovered it, they encountered a continent that had been ravaged by disease, a pandemic. It had been uh, dest economically destroyed, and there were no people. And so the first settlers went to Africa, and there was nothing there but jungle. And so there was this kind of, I guess, pre-Victorian idea of, um, of wilderness as an area that was somewhere where there were no people. So people romanticise about being at one with nature um, and reverting to this Garden of Eden. But it's just a romantic notion that the planet has been completely converted by the, the, one, the most impactful species that we have, and that is um, humanity. The other thing that we um, hear quite often is this, and one of the things that Paul Rose was it? Yes. Uh, mentioned yesterday was a balance of nature. The idea that there's a balance of nature. And we encounter this in fisheries quite a lot. And, and we, we, we get this idea that there's an equilibrium for a species. Take, for example, cod. You know, so cod in the North Sea, that there's 100 tonnes of cod in the North Sea and every year we can take 10 tonnes of cod out and it will recover back to 100 tonnes again and it will stay there. And so if we don't take too much out, the population will remain stable and we can constantly keep going and keep taking fish. Actually, fish populations, populations in ecology generally don't behave that way. Cod is not a species on its own. It lives alongside haddock and ling and saith and pollock and mackerel and lobsters and crab. I could go on. I'm a marine biologist. But, you know, it, it lives in a complex situation. And these are graphs that show a variety of different catches over time from 1950 through to 2010. So you've got herring and cod and capel and all the rest of it. You can see that none of those show stability. None of those look like a stable population where they've had a little bit taken out and then they've recovered. And it's not all down to overfishing. There's lots of things that affect populations. The fish in the North Sea are moving north at a rate of 30 kilometres every 10 years. So fish are moving north. In, in the next couple of decades, you'll start seeing an absence of cod in the southern North Sea. You'll see mackerel moving further north out of the areas that we're squabbling about with, with Norway at the moment. So this idea of stability is, is, is rubbish, really. And conservationists think about stability as, as being is, is something that they, they're addicted to, really. One of the things that we're addicted to as well as a simple solution to the world's problems is protected areas. So let's fence off a part of the world and stop people from going in and stop them from doing stuff and we'll change the world. So here we've got a, a national park in New Zealand on the right, you're right, I'm rubbish at left and right, on this side. Okay, that's a, a photograph of a national park in New Zealand. And you can see there's a distinct difference between the national park, which is a bit around the mountain, and the grass elsewhere, or the, the disturbed areas elsewhere. And in the terrestrial world, you can have boundaries and you can have fences that stop things moving around. And there are useful points to having protected areas, but they, in my mind, are not the solution. If we talk about marine protected areas, which is a, the picture on the left over there, um, that's a marine protected area just off Nantucket in the northwest Atlantic. And the, the blobs on there represent um, fishing effort, or boats fishing. And you can see that dark blue patch is, uh, those dark blue patches are marine protected areas. There are no boats in there, they're not fishing. But look at the behaviour of the boats, they're all around the edge of that 
marine protected area and they're fishing harder than ever there, taking advantage of the fact that maybe there are fish spilling over from that marine protected area. But what other damage are they doing? And so we have this idea that we should have protected and unprotected areas in the world. And I'm just not so sure that that's a good way um, to behave. Maybe we should actually try and behave in a way which is to have a, a, a broad footstep lightly trod across the whole world. We should look after the whole world, not have this is a protected area and this isn't. One of the problems you have when you have these protected areas is that you displace effort. And so people who, they can't fish in the protected area, so they fish more intensively in the areas that aren't protected. And the same thing happens with uh, terrestrial protected areas. So my message in short is some, summed up by, you could either use Brandolini's law if you've come across that, if not I'll explain it later. Um, but for every complex problem there's a, there's a solution that's simple, obvious and completely wrong. And so what, what, I, what I feel is we need to get away from the idea that there are simple solutions to the complex problems that we face in the world. We are in trouble, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying we're not, not in trouble at all. I'm really worried about what's going to happen in the next 10 to 20 years, what's going to happen to my children. We saw, we've seen stuff recently, it's horrendous. The pandemic, uh, the fire in the Gulf of Mexico, the floods in Germany just in the last couple of weeks. You know, these, these things are starting to happen more and more frequently, uh, and to me they're terrifying. We should not try and use simple solutions to complex problems. They just won't work. You know? and, but the problem is they're addictive. So you love, we all love this idea that you take some fish out, it'll come back again. Take some fish out, it'll come back again. That doesn't happen. We need to get real and get used to the fact that complexity is here. Um, and in the end, linking on to basically uh, you know, what our last speaker will talk about, it's not about ecology. The important thing is people. And that's me. Thank you. And um, we're moving on now to our next speaker, Charlotte Bonner. Um, Charlotte has recently joined the Education and Training Foundation as National Head of Education for Sustainable Development, where she is responsible for the strategic development and implementation of their work, as well as being the policy and advocacy e expert in sustainability matters. Charlotte has over 15 years experience working in sustainability and education sectors leading transformational engagement and development programs. This includes her involvement in the NUS's sustainability work and she is one of the co-founders of Students Organising for Sustainability International, leading on their partnership with the United Nations Environment Programme. Charlotte. Thanks, Anna. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the people. Um, Magnus talked about the science. Colin's going to talk about the politics, I'm going to talk about the people, and particularly with a lens on our education system, because when you have discussions about uh, environmental problems, sustainability challenges, whether that's amongst friends, whether that's in kind of political fora, whether that's in uh, citizens' assembly, often education is cited as the answer, the solution. It's all about education, we just need to educate people. And I'm going to expand and explore that a little bit this morning. Um, I was, I, I considered myself to be fairly standardly educated. I went to school, I went to uh, a sixth form college, I went to university. And it wasn't until I went to university and uh, I wanted to take my bike with me, which I don't think was a completely, uh, you know, alarming, radical idea, but I wanted to take my bike with me. And there was nowhere for me to keep said bike. I could lock it up to the lamppost outside the, the halls of residence, but I did not think that was good for my bike, nor for me keeping my bike for very long. And I wasn't allowed to keep it in the hall of residence. So I just started to ask the question, where can I keep my bike? Um, that led me to the porters, the security team. They led me to the estates team. That led me to a great man called Willie Hodeman, who was the energy and environment manager for the university. And he signposted me to the student environment group. So here I am at the age of 18, um, having four A-levels, and I was about to start my degree with my bike in my hand. And all of a sudden, I discovered that there was a group of people committed to environmental issues on my campus. And they taught me about climate change. They taught me about ethical trade. They taught me about social injustices around the world. And all this was completely new information to me. Um, and what it really showcased was that there was a huge amount of work to do, engaging with the student population, and uh, I fell into that trap of, right, we just need to sort out the education, then we'll, we'll, we'll be fine. 
But what I then realised was actually my education wasn't equipping me with what I needed to be able to take part in any sort of change making when it came to environmental issues. My formal education hadn't taught me about the biodiversity crisis, it hadn't taught me about climate change, it hadn't taught me what skills I needed to be able to do anything about those, it didn't give me any agency in terms of being able to solve those problems and it didn't really build much of a capacity to deal with those complex solutions that, that Magnus was talking about. So I don't think the problem is that we're not educating people. You know, we're really lucky in this country. We do have quality education for a large number of people. Not everybody. There's still huge problems in terms of access to that. But I think the problem is the education that we're providing and what, um, what goals we're trying to achieve through that education. And there's a great quote by a guy called David Orr, and he says that the, the destruction of the planet is not the work of ignorant people. You know, the destruction of the planet is done by people with master's degrees, PhDs, MBAs, and actually our education system is equipping people to be effective vandals of, of the earth. And there's a big political and kind of ideological debate about what is the purpose of education. Is it, you know, is it a right in its own right? Is it worthy in its own right? Is it there to equip individuals? Is it there for societal good? Is it there, as uh, Gavin Williamson, uh, Scarborough's own Gavin, uh, our Secretary of State for Education, said last week, uh, the purpose of education is to equip people for the world of work. It doesn't really matter where you sit on that spectrum. At the moment, we're not teaching people how to care for themselves, how to care for other people, how to care for... Uh, our environment and that's not something that is um, being that's not just kind of the environmental voice that's saying that you know, we've got huge business um, representation now saying that actually they see a huge problem in their ability to adapt to, to green economies because they don't have the skill sets that they require we've got huge recognition from um, from academia and from education institutions saying actually we need to change what we're teaching but they're held back by so many things that are kind of embedded within our within our education system primarily one of the major causes the curriculum itself and unless you're going through a science or a geography route you could very easily still get to the age of 18 without any solid understanding of the sustainability challenges that we face and like I say very little support to develop the skills and the agency and the value set to actually want to do something about that and I think we do need to equip all learners I think there's two things there's one developing kind of specialists in particular areas that we absolutely need specialists in so um, people that are going to do the, the the clever techie stuff that I just can't do so uh, your uh, renewable energy experts your biodiversity experts your um, you know, city planners, uh, you know, that we need specialist sustainability skills, but we also need broad sustainability skills for everybody because fundamentally any job can be a green job. Everybody has a role to play, whether that's at an individual level with your behaviours or whether that's in terms of your part of the collective in terms of how we, how we affect change. So I think we really do need to think about kind of a system change for our education society, uh, education sector. And I don't think it's naively I don't think it's particularly challenging in terms of the, I'm looking particularly at the education sector and it's actually given me a lot of hope the last 18 months that things can happen very quickly change can happen in the education sector really quickly if there is a political will to make it happen and if there is a widespread understanding of why it's happening so there's already a huge amount of um, activity and innovation and exploration and commitment from a bottom up. You know, there's teachers and learners and educators and leaders of the education sector across the country doing fantastic work. Uh, one of my favourite groups uh, is a group uh, of students from the University of Manchester a few years ago. They were economic students. They got into their degree courses and they thought, hang on a minute, why are you teaching all this? This is all the old economics that actually is causing all the problems that we can see in the world. This isn't the economics we need to, we need to be learning. We need to be learning about alternative economic systems that can create a more equitable, just, sustainable future. Um, the lecturers did not respond well to that challenge, um, so they just went about setting up their own alternative curriculum. They run a whole course alongside their formal one um, that was completely self-developed uh, self by the students, and they've now set up an organisation that works supporting economics departments and schools around the world to reform their curriculum and just amazing work so there's loads of bottom bottom up stuff happening the middle out piece kind of the organizational approaches 
how schools, colleges, universities, apprenticeship providers, what they're doing depends on the organisation, depends on the people within it. But again, there's great, great innovation happening in terms of what's being taught, how it's being taught, who it's being taught in collaboration with. Um, thinking about not just the classroom, but kind of the community and the culture of those, those education institutions. But it's not hardwired into the system. You know, there isn't that kind of top-down framework that says, yes, this is actually quite important. And I'm not one of those people to kind of constantly blame kind of the government, them, for everything. But there is a, there is a lack of uh, sustainability interest in the regulators. So in Ofsted, there's, there used to be sustainable development um, factors within the framework, they were removed. There's not anything um, in the funding mechanisms for schools, colleges, universities. The curriculum specs are really scary. If you look at the curriculum specs, less than one in 200 learners will get sustainability education as standard because um, it's just not in there. So the awarding bodies have a role to play too. And there's some sign of change. There's some things that give me hope. So at the Institute for Apprenticeships and Technical Education, they've developed new sustainability um, frameworks for all of their specifications. The Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy has been really lobbying the Department from, for Education kind of within government to do more. There's a new Green Jobs Task Force. They re re um, published their recommendations to government and industry and the skills sector this week. There's a new GCSE coming in natural history. There's a private members bill going through Parliament at the moment looking at sustainable edu education. So there is hope, there's things going on. But um, I think it just needs a bit of a catalyst and a bit of a push because I think the groundswell of kind of understanding that this is important is there. It's about how we then give the sector the, the motivation and the incentives to actually deliver on that. So in terms of what we can do, if you, could, if you work in education, ask the questions, what's going on, how are we linking to this agenda? If you know somebody in who works in education, I think most people know somebody that works in education, have those conversations. Write to the Department for Education. Apparently they only get letters about sex education and religious education. Apparently the public doesn't care about anything else. So write to the Department for Education, let them know um, your thoughts on the matter. Um, and I think the other thing is the kind of the final caveat that I will say is that I have a real issue with kind of um, us thinking that fixing the education system will fix our problems <coughs> because the people that are currently in our education system, by the time they've gone through that, if we clicked our fingers and you know, all learners were taught these sustainability knowledge skills attributes tomorrow, it's still going to take 10 years before they're in any position of power. And we don't have 10 years. We don't have the time and the urge, uh, we don't have the time to say, actually, young people will fix this for themselves. These are problems they did not create. And we, we, we are the people that actually need to up our game, whether that's in our lives, how we, how we spend our money, who we vote for, what kind of change we create so that, um, so that they have what they need um, rather than relying on them um, to fix the problems in the future. Is that right? Thank you. Okay, thanks, Charlotte. And there's an imp impeccable um, timing going on here. So we'll seamlessly um, move to Colin. Colin's distinguished career as a Labour MP saw him serve on the Environmental Audit and the Energy and Climate Change Select Committees. Founder of the All Parliamentary Group on Climate Change, Colin has campaigned on a number of environmental issues and advocates the importance of incorporating climate change awareness as part of the national curriculum. His book, Too Little Too Late, The Politics of Climate Change, was published in 2009, and there indeed is the book. Uh, Colin. Uh, just to give you a second to absorb my website address, Whilst walking up here this morning, um, I thought it was getting rather warm and indeed the weather forecast for today says that in Scarborough the temperature will re reach 25 degrees centigrade. And I was just thinking, what would it feel like if it was 50 degrees centigrade as it has been in British Columbia in the last week or so? Um, let's get straight into the graph. Uh, I'll start with this one because this tells us where we are today in 2021. 20, uh, uh, <clears throat> you'll see the various temperatures at the top, the black line, the black dots is the Arctic and the bottom is the ocean. The ocean is still a wee bit behind the global average, which on land uh, is 1.5 degrees. That's actually where we're supposed to be with the Paris Agreement in uh, 2050. So I think we're lagging behind a bit in our efforts. The global average for all of these things currently is, uh, as you can see, one degree increase. 
Um, I want to go to Michael Mann, a climate uh, scientist who's recently published a book called The New Climate War. In that, he identifies two types of people who are causing problems or have caused problems. The first is deniers. I think we're all familiar with deniers. They've been around a long time. There are fewer of them now, but they deny that the, um, the science was right and they say that there's nothing to be done and uh, even if it is human uh, caused. The next category that he identifies are doomsters. These are people who may have been deniers but now say, well actually it's too late to do anything so let's just live our own lives and uh, pretend that somehow we'll get through it. I want to add a um, third category. These are charlatans. These are our leaders. These are the people who tell us that they have solutions and they're working on it and we saw them very recently at the G7 meeting. These are the people who are fooling us, taking us for fools and are selling us absolutely uh, unrealistic solutions. I'd like to quote an earlier charlatan and this is at a time in um, uh, 1988 when it was possible that things may have um, happened that could have changed the course of history. This is President George H.W. Bush, the father, who said, those who think we're powerless to do anything about the greenhouse effect are forgetting about the White House effect. As president, I intend to do something about it. I will convene a global conference on climate change. All nations will be welcome, and indeed, all nations will be needed. So what happened? This is what happened. I don't know if you can or not read it. Uh, if we can leave this slide up a, a little bit longer. Um, this shows the great success of all the COP meetings. You can see them all listed on the gradient. The more COP meetings we have, the worse the problem gets. And if you believe in cause and effect, I would suggest that we should stop having COP meetings, cancel Glasgow. Things might improve. And once again, um, it shows that we are led by charlatans. One of the issues, uh, one of the big issues, uh, is shown on this graph where you have the same one as before, but this time superimposed on the top, the black line, the use of fossil fuels. As you can see, that line is getting sharper and sharper. It's accelerating. And our great leaders are not doing a damn thing about it. And here's why. This is the G20's public money commitments to energy recovery packages. And the black uh, bars are the investments in fossil fuels. In every case, perhaps apart from China, funnily enough, whom everybody wants to blame these days for climate change, even though they didn't cause it, uh, nearly all of them, maybe apart from France as well, more money has been spent on fossil fuels now and will be after COVID than on renewable energy. I can't see any intention there at all to deal with this problem, which only two years ago our own parliament declared was a climate emergency. They're doing knack all, frankly. Um, I don't want to all be, you know, just um, too down on this, of course, even though um, it is a disastrous situation. In my book, which was published uh, 12 years ago, I do detail uh, a couple of um, things which I think would offer solutions. Um, I don't want to go into all the technological solutions because these are failing us, even though they might develop and become worthwhile in time, things like carbon capture and storage. What I talk about in the book, to a certain extent, is behavioural change. This is the one thing that politicians do not want to touch. They want you to, to believe that technology will sort it all out. So our government, going to Glasgow in uh, November, is saying, for example, um, to trans you know, transport emissions of carbon can be solved by having electric vehicles. They don't mention using public transport as a potential solution. They don't want to change our habits. They don't want to say, get out of your cars, cycle, walk, or anything else. They're saying you will have bigger cars. If you go around Scarborough these days and see the cars that are now parked, as I do every time I go for a walk each day, they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So I think there's a lot of people who do need to make some behavioural change. The final two things, which I don't really have time to develop then, 
the global framework needs to be based on something called contraction and convergence, which is to say that by 2050 we get to zero, not net zero, but we get to zero. And if, as a global population, we got to zero carbon emissions, everybody in the world would converge on that zero. We just need to manage that process, and that is this framework called contraction and convergence. The second thing, a policy which I tried to push forward in a bill round about 2005, it was then called domestic tradable quotas. I prefer a friendlier personal carbon allowance, something that you could actually trade. So if you're not using your quota of carbon, you could actually sell that and make some dosh out of it. But that quota goes down every year to the determined point by science. So eventually, 2050, you would have no quota left and nothing to sell and nobody have and you need to buy it because we'd be at zero. Those are two things which I can't really develop uh, in detail now, but um, I do have my final two copies of this book available this morning for five pounds each, that is, not for two of them. Uh, so hopefully I'm done within my time. Thank you. Well, thank you again to all of our speakers. And now um, it's time to sort of hand over to you if we've got any questions. Yes. I could answer that question. I could take that as a question, but I yeah. <laughs> No, no, you're taking the no comment approach to this one. <laughs> no, no. It's, so small pelagic, you started me now. So small pelagic fish have this natural fluctuation in populations that happens, happen, forage fish do it all the time. So, so managing, it's, a, it's an interesting point because managing them in the same way as you might manage whales, for, if you want to eat whales, uh, for example, it, it'd be very different. With forage fish, you want to take as many as you can when they are there and then don't take any when there aren't any. Okay. But, sorry, that wasn't, a quest that wasn't an answer to the question that wasn't there. Yeah. Okay. And I think we had our next question here. Yeah, question for Colin. On your graph, India had a massive bath of other energy. And what's that? Exactly. That would be mainly bioenergy. Um, so, and I, I didn't mention bioenergy in the talk, uh, but I think we've been sold a bit of a con with bioenergy. I recently saw a report that showed that the actual carbon cost, if you like, of uh, wood pellets going to Drax, our local <coughs> power station, which accounts for 8% of the UK's electricity feed, uh, is actually worse than coal. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure if that's a peer-reviewed paper or anything, but the point is, um, is that it's, it's, it's called BECS in the terminology of the Climate Change Committee. BECS stands for bioenergy carbon capture and storage. So the idea is that um, you can have the bioenergy and it's shipped over here from North Carolina and South Carolina and uh, then to Liverpool I think and by train to Drax. Um, and then the idea is uh, that we'll have carbon capture and storage so that what goes up the chimney stack will be sent then pumped by pipe into the North Sea, the um, old oil fields. I remember nearly 20 years ago when we were being told that it'll only take another 20 years for carbon capture and storage to be implemented on a commercial scale. It is still not implemented on a commercial scale and it's, it's minute, it's puny. And the problem with it, which we don't get told, is that the more that you capture the carbon at the power plant, the less efficient that plant becomes because the more energy you need to capture the carbon. So there is a trade-off. It's not simply you get all 100% of it and um, you get your 100% electricity output. It's just yet another thing that we've been fooled with and the Climate Change Committee, I think, is uh, partly to blame because the politicians can just point at them and say, oh, well, you told us this was OK. Um, I think it depends where the wood pellets are coming from, probably. I mean, 
Uh, there are um, obviously quite a lot of these things around and there will be for some time. But I think um, even with this government we are seeing a trend away from domestic wood burning. Um, so I think it depends how you source them. If they're coming from the Carolinas, I would say get rid of your wood pellet burner. Okay, yes. Um, Charlotte tells us that education is improving but it won't kick in fast enough for the problem. Colin tells us two really good things that we need to happen. <coughs> but since we're being led by charlatans, how are those things ever going to happen? Um, well, if, I'll answer that one first if I may. Uh, let's change the electorate. Let's get them to stop buying these stupid SUVs. Let's get them to do the things that are right. I mean, cut out meat for a start off, but which politician is gonna say no more meat? Uh, or perhaps even no more dairy? I mean, I'm a vegetarian and I'd hate to see the end of eggs in my diet, for example. Um, this is our great problem. It's like a catch-22. The politicians won't move until the electorate moves. The electorate won't move until their behavior is changed by the politicians. And I am, I'm perhaps falling into a doomster camp on this one. I don't want to be a doomster, but can anybody point to how you can change the global population's behavior and have politicians who are willing to take that on board? Charlotte, do you want to respond and then we'll come to Magnus? Well. I'll go and then, yeah. <laughs> I think there's a couple of things. I don't generally think that government tell people what to do. I don't think our policy, the policy that government pass is rarely kind of at the forefront of innovation. It normally responds to things that the public are already quite comfortable in accepting of. And so I think there is definitely a role for kind of grassroots community organising to affect some of that behaviour change so that it becomes more palatable at a policy level. Um, and I think that's something that we can all carry with us as something that we can contribute to. I also think that it's really interesting at the moment that one of the, one of the things that I would say is one of the reasons that policymakers don't do anything too bold in terms of people, you know, pro prohibiting individual behaviours is because of um, business lobbying and because of the, uh, the power that, that big business has in our governing structures. But what I see now is that actually <laughs> the Aldersgate group, for example, they're a business representative body. Collectively, their members make, they have like a turnover of something ridiculous, like 350 billion pounds a year turnover. They're saying, as part of their lobbying, we need more environmental regulation. We need to be given a firm commitment that this is the direction that we're going in so that we can persuade our investors that, that their money is safe and so that we can invest in this knowing that it is the right direction for our business. And so if there's public kind of groundswell saying, yep, this is important to us, look, we, we, we're already adopting the behaviours that we need to, and business is saying we need more regulation, then it's kind of a lobster. It's kind of a lobster, isn't it? You kind of get your pincer in the middle, that kind of sweet point where, where then the policy changes. But I don't think policy comes first. I don't think it's like seatbelts. It wasn't as though um, nobody wore a seatbelt and then they introduced seatbelt legislation. Then all of a sudden, people started wearing seatbelts. You know, people wore seatbelts beforehand. There was a bell curve of kind of early adopters. And then there was the more people that found out about seatbelts, wore their seatbelts, and there was a tipping point where more people were wearing seatbelts than weren't wearing seatbelts. Then the legislation got, came into place and sorted out the people that were kind of the laggards in that, in that change process. So I think there's, there's a lot that we... I don't buy into this kind of individuals will change everything, but I think if we want to see the policy landscape change, it does start with us, and it starts with how businesses uh, respond to the challenges too. Uh, so there's a the fund, fundamental problem we have is that we, our society has changed faster than we have. Um, so we, we evolved to live in a group of about 20 people um, and have personal relationships with everybody around us. And society's changed and society isn't dealing very well with the fact that we're still primitive in, in the way that we behave as, as a society. And I, just, uh, I think that's what we need to do is find ways of using human behaviour. You can't change human behaviour easily, but what you can do is set things up so that humans do things that are beneficial. Uh, I'll just give you one lobstery example. Okay, so um, the lobster fishery in, in Scarborough, um, the, 
you, if you V-notch a lobster, if you put a, a notch in the tail of a lobster, it can't be landed, okay? And it's used as a conservation measure. So um, a few years ago, the IFCA, the Inshore Fisheries and Conservation Authority for the Northeast, bought lots of lobsters off fishermen, V-notched them, put them back in the water. Now, when a fisherman catches that lobster, he, it's illegal to land it and can't land it. Now, that's quite nice, that's quite good, but it costs money, you know, because you have to buy the lobster and then, you know, it means they stay V-notched for a little while. But what we found happening was that fishermen started V-notching lobsters themselves. And it wasn't altruism, it wasn't a be nice to the planet and save lobster lives and all the rest of it. What they'd do is they'd catch a lobster that was just slightly undersized. So it's 87 millimetre carapace length is the minimum landing size for a lobster, okay? If you catch one that's 86 and a half, and then you put it back in the water, the next person that catches it is going to get it at 87 millimetres and can land it. Whereas if you put a V-notch in the tail, you stop your mate over there from landing the lobster. So... Uh, and there's a whole lot of other reasons. So if you catch a lobster that's got one claw, uh, they call them cripples in, in fishermen terms. If you've got no claws, they call them nuns. Uh, but but if, you v-notch, so if, you, if you catch a lobster that's got one claw, eventually it will regrow that claw and it will become... A, a, you don't land it because it's not worth very much money. People want to buy whole lobsters with two claws. If it's only got one, you'll get less money for it. So you think, is it worth keeping? Nah, I'll V-notch it. I've got a V-notch it because I don't want him to catch it next month when it's regrowing its claw again. So it's taking advantage of that, that mean, nasty streak that human beings have and turning it around so that it has benefit, it causes benefit. So um, that's what we need more of. And I just wanted to... I thought Charlotte raised a really interesting point that I hadn't thought about before. We are kind of just passing it on, aren't we? we the, my generation are saying to people, oh, kids will sort it out. You know, we're kind of passing on the responsibility. I think she's absolutely right. I'm l- listening now to thinking of um, what you were saying about my travels around the world. And I'm thinking, I've been taking 40 students every year to Malaysia and Indonesia, and Tobago and all the rest of it for the last 10 years. How many forests have I burned, you know? And I, I, so people, my generation, need to now, now, today, take responsibility and start changing our behaviours and leave things in a better condition for our kids. So I, I, think you're, I think that passing things on is a really bad thing for us to be doing. Yes. need to know as part of their environmental education they say oh they need to learn about climate change if you ask young people what they need to know they're like we know about climate change we're terrified about climate change we need the skills that we're going to need to adapt and do something about climate change so please teach us how to grow our own food and how to write to politicians and how to affect change positively and how to build boats and you know that it becomes very very practical in terms of the skills that you need and I think you're right Chris I am I got very disillusioned after my first job. I started work as a sustainability consultant and they gave me a brand new company car and then <laughs> wouldn't let me take the train anywhere because it was less tax efficient than the car that I didn't want them to give me. It was really frustrating. Um, and I thought, right, this is ridiculous. I'll, I'll go and be a home economics teacher. That sounds like a lovely thing to do and I can kind of connect people with sustainability issues by food because I think it's a really good tool to use 
to have conversations with people about sustainability because it's universal. You know, everyone eats, everyone has to eat, and therefore it's a, it's, a, it's a universal thing that you can start to build a conversation about the complexity of sustainability challenges, about sourcing, about um, consumer versus producer, about uh, food waste. You know, it's a really great topic to get people involved in. And then I was just horrified because home economics doesn't exist on the national curriculum in, the UK, in England anymore. It does in Scotland. Uh, I'm not so sure about Wales and Northern Ireland. But I think that kind of practical skills as well as knowledge, here is the science, here is the stats, but those practical skills are exactly what we should be instilling uh, mm. as part of our education system. And I think if you're going to talk to people about sustainability, food is a really good starting point. And I think that aligns, doesn't it, Magnus, with things that you're doing with the lobsters? I mean, sort of encouraging the idea of the natural produce that we've got here that we can make. And encourage people to buy local. So I'm involved in a, a, a project called the Bridlington Bay Lobster Capital of Europe. And the idea is that when you see people eating fish and chips along the seafront here, quite often they're eating fish that's caught in Norway or Iceland. Why are they doing that when there's lobster off the coast here, you know, uh, which hasn't travelled so far? There's a great product. I mean, what we're trying to do is, is change the way that people eat lobster by turning it into something that you can have lobster and chips, you know, with, like scampi, you know. Uh, so, so there's a real, there's lots of potential. I, I mean, I'm a big fan of food miles. I know that I know that when you look at the big picture, sometimes that the carbon cost of transporting food isn't huge um, relative to some other costs. But the whole thing about People are buying American, I mean, I'm a lobster expert, I'm sorry, I'm going to talk about lobster, but, but people are buying American lobsters that are flown over to the UK, and the, the carbon equivalent in weight of a, a kilo of lobster flown over from the States is 50 kilos, okay? By the time it's been caught and it's been put on a plane and transported across to the UK, and, and this is a live lobster and you've eaten it, it's 50 kilos of carbon for one kilo of lobster. That's a small child. I mean, that's, that's probably you, Charlotte. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's a lot of carbon, you know. So we really should be thinking about, thinking about where we get our food from. And it's not just the carbon cost; it's the social cost. You know, I'd much if you spend ten pounds in Scarborough, that's twenty five. By the time you multiplied it up, some clever economist has worked it out it's worth twenty five pounds to the local economy. You know, if you buy a lobster from the states, that's money going to the, going out of the out of the system. You know, we should try to buy locally. But it's impossible. I was trying to find... I had a very middle-class morning yesterday um, where uh, I, I'd run out of sourdough bread and I had no <laughs> Guatemalan coffee beans left. So I, I, I came into Scarborough and I thought, I'll try and find somewhere that will sell coffee beans at half past nine on a Friday... Was it Friday yesterday? Friday morning. I tr tried to find a little shop and there wasn't one. I had to go to Sainsbury's. It's I mean, that's awful, you know. Uh, why doesn't the high street stay open till eight o'clock at night so that people can use the shop? Anyway, I'm oh, sorry, I'm going on. Oxfam sell a grumpy mule coffee and oh, it's roasted in home first and it's delicious. Yeah. <laughs> Write that down, everyone. Yeah. Um, <laughs> a bit for Oxfam there. Go Oxfam. <laughs> Question here. Thanks. Okay. Uh, just coming back to Maggie, that's the start of what I said there are no simple solutions. To me, you know, we do need to link the amount of fossil fuel we use with what we're allowed to use. Um, and and there's, there's various debates going on on Facebook and all the things of the uh, Earth uh, Facebook page and green things and everything else. And uh, I put a comment, I said, why don't we just double the cost of fuel and half the cost of public transport? And more people will leave their car and get on the train, you know, and then change their habits. And I thought, I'm not seeing why that. I said, well, I'm in the countryside, I'll go back. Yes, I can't get to But you've got to start somewhere. It's a very simple thing the government could do. Like they said, if we all had to stay at home, that's the year of living this year. They can make new things in Paris. You know, on the turn of days in the summer, uh, cars and the even registration number or non registration number are only allowed to drive into Paris because of the air pollution. So governments can take a decision. This is why we have a government. They're, you know, they're supposed to look after us in our future and plan it. So, <laughs> why is that not a simple answer? Why is that possible? <laughs> <laughs> Can I answer? Yeah. So I, I agree, but I don't think this, the solution is to legislate. We've got to find... So I live in Hackness, you know, it's beautiful. Um, I have to drive into town. 
Uh, I would take a bus if there was a bus. Ideally, my, my, the best thing I could do would be to take a bus that I could put my bike on so that when I get into Scarborough, I can cycle around. I work in Hull. Um, I have to commute. Um, it's impossible for me to meet the train, uh, and the train times are awful, and it's cold, and they're dreadful, and all the rest of it. So it's, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's legislation. I think it's about putting things in front of people so they're easy to do, you know, so that people, because not everybody cares. And people, if people don't care, they're not, going to, they're not going to bother. But if you make things easy for them, and you use that mean-spirited behaviour that humans have, uh, you know, you make it free on the bus. People will take the bus instead of driving. You know, you make it convenient; they'll do it. If you tell them they have to take a bus, they'll find another way of, of going. You know, the, 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 you know, the rule of unintended consequences from legislation is, is really strong. Yeah. I say, I think it's um, a combination of both. Uh, it's encouragement and um, that can take many forms, um, peer group pressure, um, but it's also legislation. So it's a combination of both things. Um, if you had personal carbon allowances, you'll get a financial reward for doing the right thing. People will often do things for a financial reward. I mean, if everybody had been told when seat belts were introduced that every week you wear one, you'll get five quid, <laughs> the take-up would have been far faster. Um, the same is true, I think, in tackling climate change. Um, and as regards uh, public transport in Hackness, I mean, um, back in the days when I was an MP, uh, I lived about five miles from my local station, which is in Wakefield, and I used my fold-up Brompton bike <laughs> to cycle to the station in all weathers, and despite the fact there's a long gradient on the way back home, uh, which sometimes caused me problems, um, that did come to a sudden halt when I crashed into a pothole that was left behind by Westminster City Council. Tory controlled and usual austerity story, I suppose. So I think there are solutions. Brompton's, by the way, the best uh, fold-up bike in the world, is made in Britain. So invest in it. It does cost quite a bit now, but you can also get electrified bikes. And many people are doing this. Why not give people rewards for getting an electric bike? I mean, that journey from Hackness to the station would be dead easy. It's nearly all on the flat. You'd be in there straight away. And there should be cycle storage facilities. All these things have to be done, but they have to be done so quickly because as the first graph I showed uh, illustrates, the problem that we have stored up for ourselves is already exceeding by far what the scientists have modeled. That carbon is already in the atmosphere that is going to take us well beyond two degrees, never mind 1.5, and I don't think that was a serious target anyway in Paris, um, but I don't want to get started on the subject of the Paris Agreement. It makes my blood boil, so I'll leave it at that. Yes, question here. Well, from my point of view, as a still, even now, a member of the Labour Party, <coughs> I have to say the answer is no. They are frightened of losing their seats, and that's all there is to it. Everybody has to be act. Everybody has to do something. You know, yeah, yeah. But that's this room. This is yeah. This is that self-selecting audience. It's not us. Well, you know, we have to do more, but it's. It's, uh, it's outside, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't know whether I'm allowed to say this in this environment, but firstly, I'd vote green rather than, you know, your big two. And I think there is really something about that kind of personal conversations and personal connections. And I remember having a chat with somebody who at the time was the president of the Danish National Union of Students when we were setting up SOS. And he was like, I don't understand why the young campaigners, and this was, um, this is really dangerous territory now, um, that wanted to remain in the Brexit vote. He was like, why didn't you just have a ring your granny com uh, campaign? And it's about those personal conversations where you're like, actually, this does impact us. These are the things that, 
I value and you're my family and let's have a conversation with us. And, you know, sometimes that's impossible and very frustrating. Um, but I think, you know, we do have to start with the spheres of control that we have. And sometimes they're very small spheres of control, but they're still, you know, control. In, where are your spheres of influence? And is that in your personal life, in your professional life, in your, in your political decisions? And I think we need to be less... Um, embarrassed about them <laughs> I think there's a, I think there's quite a strong bit it's like I, li- I like doing my bit I've this is like spot brought to you by Brompton but I've got my Brompton I've been around <laughs> it was the Brompton at York University that I didn't want to leave locked up outside it's why I got to Brompton was because I couldn't take another bike to to uni it did get nicked the first time I left it outside as uh, I, w- I was right but um you know I People are always surprised. They're like, you came on a bike. I'm like, yes, I came on a bike. And they're like, but it's three miles. I'm like, I know. <gasps> and slowly, slowly, I see little t- little seeds of change. I think, oh, Jodie, my best friend, when I first lived with her, her dad brought her bike up and she wouldn't get off the pavement. And I remember her really vividly cycling down the pavement with a carrier bag on a handlebar and a rolled up cigarette in her hand. And I just think, oh. And now she cycles 70 miles a week. And I'm so proud of her. But it's because I'd like to think of some of the work that I did to kind of normalise that. So I think we do have a duty to kind of make explicit why we believe these things, why they matter, and why we do them to kind of make that knock on impact as, as, as strong as it can be. I think there was a question here yeah, as so. well. The graphs that we saw were, they were quite long term graphs. I was wondering if, uh, if there was actually a fall in um, carbon or pollution during the, the lockdowns. Yeah. Um, there has been a decrease in the increase. I think that's the best way of putting it. Uh, I think it was, uh, I did read it was about 7 or 8% uh, less carbon was emitted. Uh, into the atmosphere but that effect is going to be wiped out by the the rebound so I don't think any climate scientists um, perhaps for some narrower interest in what effect that uh, lockdown had uh, maybe its impact on future policy but the actual decrease in the increase in carbon emissions I'm afraid uh, hasn't relieved us of the task ahead and uh, oh yes yeah yeah, there was, and um, I mean, you could. I mean, I I'm not arguing against electric vehicles, for example. I'm arguing against the behaviour that demands an electric vehicle to replace uh, a fossil fuel-powered uh, vehicle, because the construction costs of that electric vehicle. And we know that there's great problems mining lithium now, which um, you know it's it's almost like blood diamonds that I've been reading about, Colombia and places. No, not Colombia. It's um, Bolivia, anyway, somewhere in South America. Um, there are great issues about the supply of that uh, material. And I just think we've got to change our behaviour. And that, I'm afraid, will not happen without the legislation and without all the peer group pressure that is needed as well. Okay. Uh, have we got a question? I think if we take a question from Kane and then come to you, is that okay? Because we just I'm just looking at time. painters those people in cars. There's a new town that's been developed in Holland which is entirely built around the concept of the bike and cars are excluded around the edges and there's nowhere for you to drive uh, and park or garages and so on. So I think um, even in a hilly place like Scarborough, I mean it's often used as an excuse 
not to have a bike in Scarborough, but with electric bikes now, that is no longer an excuse. I think I used to work with a, um, a cycling promotion organisation and they told me that um, for a long time, you know, city planners, town planners in this country, um, they'll have their annual conference, you know, the annual conference. I don't know the name of the Trade Association for City Planners, I'm afraid. I apologise. But they'd, they'd want to invite over Dutch town planners. And it's got to the point now where the Dutch town planners won't come because like, we've told you it's really simple. You just need to plan. You need to plan. You need to make a commitment and you need to make it on a long term basis so that the plans you're making now for your cycling infrastructure are going to take 10, 15, 20, 20 years to really realise but you need to be consistent in how you plan your plan your towns around more active sustainable methods of transport you can't there aren't quick fixes there aren't simple solutions it's a long-term planning process and if you have that commitment to it it will happen and if you don't it won't it's really simple but everything's against you you know so <laughs> it does you know, I used to work at the wonderful Scarborough campus when the university was up there uh, I'm now working in Hull um, and I used to cycle in and out from Hackness every day. I was much skinnier and much fitter and much happier, <laughs> even though I occasionally gave lectures in Lycra to students, uh, which they didn't enjoy. But shorter, uh, longer t-shirts was one of my module evaluation questionnaire responses. <laughs> so, but, but now, if I want to go to Hull, it's almost impossible. There's nowhere to, I can't lock my bike up at um, Seymour Station anywhere, really. Um, I can't book my bike on the train, or I couldn't, I don't know if it's changed recently, but I could not book my bike on the train. And if I don't want to get there, find that I can't get on the train, I've got a lecture at 10 o'clock, I get off at the other end, um, and I, I, I cycle in university, there's nowhere to leave a bike at the Hull end either. It's just, it's like everything is against you, you know, and whereas it, there are some simple fixes that would change behaviours of some people, and that would be a good start. I mean, I'm a real believer in everybody doing what they can, doing a little bit. It's not enough, but it's a start, and maybe it'll build momentum you know do we yeah yeah i think we've just got time for one one more question yeah There's a really good um, academic unit out of, I'm going to say sorry, it might be Sussex, I apologise. One or the other, it's called the Centre for the Understanding of Sustainable Prosperity, and it talks really about prosperity rather than growth, and kind of once we get to a place where there is, radical as this may be as an idea, uh, social justice and accessible uh, kind of quality of life and within our environmental boundaries that actually that's it that's what we're aiming for is that prosperity and then it will be a maintain it's a bit like weight loss i suppose you kind of you, you get there and then you maintain and i suppose that's what we're looking for as well is kind of to get to that sustainable and just equilibrium and stay there but they do some really interesting work around kind of metrics that we could use other than gdp to measure prosperity about what that looks like at a, at a city planning level at a national government level they do some really interesting work it's one of the you know your inbox gets filled full of newsletters it's one of the only ones that i actually read it's really interesting so they're called cusp i recommend them Okay, um, well, I think we've, we've run out of time now, um, but I just want to thank you for your attention and for your uh, really good questions. And I think if we could say a final thank you to our panellists for some really stimulating discussions.